we've got a special event for you. We are going to hear from one of the contractors who, who's worked on the major conservation project which is currently going on on the Elizabeth Tower. The company has in recent years worked on a number of high profile heritage projects, including, of course, the Elizabeth Tower. So good evening, Gavin. Good evening and uh, thank you for your very, very kind introduction. You're very welcome. So Ballantine Castings, um, and I think we have a, an image of the foundry uh, in action. I think it's on the next, there we are, uh, which is a wonderful um, theatrical image with molten iron and so on. So um, as I was explaining in the introduction, the great clock of Westminster began ticking on the 31st of May, 1859 and the bells shortly afterwards. And so this year marks the 162nd birthday of Big Ben. But as I understand it, your company goes back even further than that. So I wonder if we could begin by you telling us a little bit about the history of Ballantine Castings. Of course, um, I mean, our history isn't quite as illustrious um, as that of the Elizabeth Tower, but um, we do go back a long way. We were set up in 1820 by two brothers who almost immediately upon setting up the company, had a huge falling out and one of them emigrated to, to, um, to America. Um, we were then formally established in 1856 and ever since then we've been on our site here in Bonesse producing castings. And the area that we're in, in central Scotland, was really the, well, it was the backbone of the industrial revolution for foundries in Scotland and the, some of the biggest foundries that have ever existed in the entire history of the world existed in this area. Um, we only played a very, very small part in, in all of that, but it's um, something, that, something that we're really proud of and um, it's nice to be able to look back. So I am the seventh generation of Ballantyne family to be running the family from Foundry from this site. That's wonderful. So seven generations of this foundry remaining in the family and that wonderful picture, very atmospheric of people. I think when we spoke about this earlier, you said that they're making um, moulds or they're making templates for the moulds from wood. Yes, is that correct? Yeah, so they're woodworkers, which in the, in the industry is known as a pattern maker. And amazingly enough, that where that image is taken is actually still our pattern shop today. Um, we don't make the guys wear flat caps anymore, but <laughs> we still use that building today. Wonderful. Um, now, I went on your website and I came across this quote and I just wanted to share uh, this with our audience. You said, my grandfather used to claim that in every city in the UK, you are never further than a hundred paces from a casting made by Ballantines. Now, what I wanted to ask you, Gavin, is, is that true? Uh, he, he did usually make the claim after a couple of whiskeys, but um, <laughs> we, we, uh, we did put it to the test. Uh, we put it to the test in Edinburgh. And amazingly enough, it, it really wasn't far from the mark. Um, you, you've got to remember that iron castings have been made in the UK from the 15th century. Obviously, that grew hugely in the 18th and 19th century with new technology. Um, so every single day you walk past a, a myriad of different castings that, um, that you kind of take for granted. Um, so because of this, the, the landscape of the UK and especially in the, the urban landscape is, is effectively littered with uh, items of cast iron. So these are everything from um, post boxes, like you can see there, that was painted gold for Chris Hoy in, um, in Edinburgh. Um, rainwater goods, manhole covers, street signs, bollards, railings, cast iron lighting. And uh, we've been making these items for, for about 200 years. So you, you really are never far from something that's been made from this foundry. That's fascinating. So um, what I wanted to ask you is, are there projects that you've worked on in recent years that our audience, both in London and across the UK, might be familiar with? I think we've got some images. Maybe you could share some of those with us. So I thought this was quite a nice segue because you can see the tower in the background. But the, the biggest contract we've ever done in, in recent years um, was Westminster Bridge. So we rebuilt all of the fascia panels on the spans. Um, it's about 250 metres long and each casting was approximately 30 metres long. Um, in total, I think we had to make 190 different patterns and um, I think it was about 285 tonnes of ironwork in total for that job. Um, again, that's probably one of the biggest contracts we've worked on and, and the most complex. And I understand you won a National Heritage Award for your work on that high profile Ooh. project. We did. Thank you for bringing that up. There, there aren't <laughs> many awards for iron foundries these days, so we, we were very glad to get that one. That's wonderful. Let's move on to the next uh, image. 
Ah, yeah, so that's the, the National Galleries in Edinburgh. Um, that was um, redone in the oh, about 15 years ago. And we did about three and a half kilometres of bespoke cast iron railings, lighting columns, gates and um, access ramps to, to surround the, the, the two galleries. Wow, it looks looks beautiful. So that included the lampposts and the gates and everything. Is that right? It did, yeah, it did. It was it was the full the full suite, shall we say, of ironwork. Okay, and now we go to a much larger structure, a bridge in Glasgow, and I think this was again a major project for you. It was. It was one of the, the first ones that I had to manage it myself. So um, I was petrified of this bridge for for about two years. Um, this, the bridge was pretty much falling down and uh, for the Commonwealth Games they decided to do it up and um, to do Glasgow up and we were charged with completely replacing the entire parapet and two of the spandrels. So again in, in terms of castings I think there's about 3,000 different castings and it was about 198 tonnes of ornamental cast iron. We, we also did the, the lighting columns that um, you can just about see uh, on the top of the bridge. Fantastic. Um, I think the next one, the next image we have uh, is also in Scotland and maybe some people will have seen these if they visited Edinburgh Castle, these amazing cannons. Tell us about those. Yeah, so uh, most people would think these are original. So Edinburgh Castle gave us one of their cannons and asked us to replicate it exactly. Um, so in total we made 14 cannons um, with the trunnions and the wheels um, as an exact replica of the older ones that they had there. Um, the amazing thing is because they're exact replicas, um, they could actually fire. Um, so they are technically working cannons. Um, so I wouldn't recommend the siege on Edinburgh Castle anytime soon. <laughs> Indeed not. Well, thanks for that warning. Uh, and let's move on. I think this is the last, I think, of our images. Yeah, amazing, quite different. Tell us about these. Yeah, so every now and again, um, an artist comes to us with a, a rather strange request and nothing is stranger from my point of view than a couple of five tonne cast iron heel and coos or island cows as you'd say down south. Um, so these were to make, there used to be, these were on the site of uh, McGowan's Toffee Factory, which is a huge toffee factory in Scotland and they had the two Highland cows as their logo. Sadly, when the company closed down, they wanted to retain some of the, the history there. So they chose a couple of rather enormous cast iron cows to, to stand there at Pride of Place. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Now, just moving on to something slightly different. Um, three years ago in 2018, the UK Parliament staged a major exhibition in Westminster Hall called um, Voice and Vote, and it was to celebrate 100 years since women first got the vote. Now, as well as the names that people will know, like Millicent Fawcett and Emmeline Pankhurst, there was another leading figure in the suffrage movement called Emily Wilding Davidson, and she's remembered here at Westminster primarily for a piece of direct action that she took in 1911. On the night of the census, on April the 2nd, she hid in a cupboard in the crypt of Westminster Hall so she could give her address on the census as the Houses of Parliament. Now, I, can you tell us about Ballantyne's connection to this remarkable person? Yes, yeah, so we we were really quite quite honoured to win the contract to do the railings around her grave. So sadly, like like a lot of the cast iron railings and like a lot of cast iron in the UK, um, the railings were removed during the war effort. Um, so that that lovely grave there, where they just had the the sandstone surrounding it. Um, so all we had to work from in this instance was a, a really grainy old sepia photo um, to work from. So it was really difficult to pick up the, the intricate floral arrangements. Um, but thanks to a rather skilled kind of workforce, we we're able to recreate what we think was there originally. And the end results, I, I think they speak for themselves. You know, there's, there's some small jobs that you're really proud of. And uh, that's no, certainly one of them. It's it's very peaceful image, isn't it? Very beautiful. Um, and I understand that the gravestone bears the suffragette motto, deeds, not words. And indeed, Emily Wilding Davidson is probably best remembered for another one of her deeds, which uh, took place a hundred um, and eight years ago this month. And the clue is her unused return rail ticket from Epsom Racecourse to Victoria Station, dated the 4th of June, 1913. Derby Day. And at the 1913 Derby, Emily stepped onto the race course and was trampled by the King's horse Amna and died of her injuries four days later. 
Now, Emily Wilding Davidson's funeral took place, as I say, 108 years ago this month on the 14th of June 1913, and 5,000 women dressed in white formed a procession behind her coffin as it was taken from Victoria to King's Cross Station, and hundreds of men who were also supporters of the cause followed behind, and 50,000 people lined the route. And of course, from King's Cross, Emily made her final journey to Morpeth in Northumberland. So let's get back to the Elizabeth Tower conservation project. How did Ballantines first become involved with that project? So we've kind of been working on, on the entire Palace of Westminster for, for about the last 10 years. Um, what most people don't know, and I, I include myself in this number, um, is that if you look up at the Palace of Westminster, everything that is grey is cast iron. So usually you think that would be slate or lead or or painted wood, um, but it's actually all cast iron. Um, so over the last 10 years, we've been slowly but surely replacing all of the damaged and all of the corroded roof tiles. Um, I, don't, I don't have an exact count uh, on how many we've done, but I, I reckon it's between about two and a half to, to about three and a half thousand individual roof tiles. What, what you've got to bear in mind and what makes the building so well, crazy to be perfectly honest, is that these roof tiles are about 50 to 60 kilos each. Um, so based on just that number alone, that's over 200 tonnes of metalwork just sitting on the roof um, before the substructures even, even kind of thought about. Um, so it's been, yeah, so we've had quite quite a lot of time working on the palace um, and it's been yeah, very interesting from the start. And I think we can see in that final image the difference between the new tiles and the old ones that were in the first image that you showed us. Yes. So, oh, sorry, no, 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 go ahead, Gavin. So the, the amazing thing with the, the old roof tiles and something that we've never seen before is that a lot of them had tiny wee holes in them, which isn't something that would naturally happen to cast iron because it, it would crack. And the problem was what they actually were was it was shrapnel in the war. And because it hit it at such heat, it just went straight through the cast iron. Um, so we've had to replace a lot of the ones due to shrapnel damage. Wow, that's interesting. So um, when you started your work on the Elizabeth Tower, I know that you were replacing roof tiles there too. So was this just a continuation or were there new challenges that were presented? Uh, unfortunately, it was, it was far more complex. Um, we kind of thought we were the, the experts in cast iron roof tiles, but um, yeah, we turns out we didn't know very much at all. Um, so what we've learned effectively with kind of neo-baroque or gothic architecture is that it's, it's never easy and it's never straightforward. Um, as you can see from the, the image there, the, the, the gradient of this roof uh, and the shaping of it meant that even in even for what we call a small roof in, in the parliament, I think we needed 100, no, sorry, it was 300 different patterns just, just for the, the Elizabeth Tower roof itself. Um, all of these as well had to be, we only had one millimeter tolerance on every single face. Um, because they had to slot perfectly into each other because gravity uh, and hooks are the main thing that hold the entire structure up. Um, so yeah, the, the other kind of complex thing with this roof was that there was no drawings originally at all. Um, so everything we made had to be made from a sample that had been taken off the roof. Um, so we were really just guided by what was there previously, um, which considering you know quite a few of them were corroded was, was quite a tricky thing to do. Um, so yeah, as much as we've loved working on it, it was certainly a, a very complex task to undertake. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think in the first image, we did see that each tile had a unique identifier because as you say, no two tiles were exactly the same uh, that yeah. you were taking off the roof. And also, I think we saw something else that you made, which were the, I think they're called, I think we've got another picture, I think shortly, but where we can see in this image where the, the, the tiles are, you also made, I think they're called roll cover castings, which were designed to hold the tiles in place. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. And they, there's, there's a joining line between all the castings and the cover rolls act as effectively a, a rain barrier between them. Um, so that's another reason the castings had to be so exact because these just slotted over the top of them. Um, they, they were a bit easier than the tiles themselves, but still quite tricky. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, um, when people were booking to come on this uh, to this event this evening, they might have read the information that was on the site. And if they did, they would have read something rather intriguing that said you also worked on the gutters, which were so big you can swim in them. Now, that sounds intriguing. So please tell us about the gutters and whether anyone took a dip in order to test them. 
I have to admit, I'm probably the, the most boring man in the world when it comes to gutters. I, I get quite excited about them, much to the annoyance of my family. Um, and these these are most certainly the, the, the most exciting gutters we've worked on. There were there were two types. The, the, the first one you can see there was just one of the, the kind of straight ones. They're, they're three metres long and they weighed about 220, 230 kilos. Um, but the more exciting ones are the, the next image that will be coming out, these rounded ones. Now, they, they're truly enormous. They're, they're about half a ton each. Um, it's quite hard to see from the image, but they're about maybe 700 millimetres wide and about a metre deep. So if you were, you'd have to be hard to push, but if you're thin enough and willing enough, you could swim all the way around Big Ben, which would be a fantastic experience, but not, not one that I do myself, I don't think. It sounds like something that Mary Poppins might have organised for the Banks children, doesn't it? A quick swim around the tower. Um, now, people in the audience might be surprised to learn how much of the structure of the Elizabeth Tower is made of cast iron, because although the bottom is brick and stone, the upper third is all cast iron. So to understand a little bit more about this amazing material, can you give us a brief explanation of the different stages from start to finish in making an iron casting? Yeah, of course. I can. I, but before I start this, I just want to apologise. I've been trying to explain to my wife for years how to make a casting and I failed miserably. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and make it as simple as possible. Um, everything that's made in cast iron starts off handmade or hand carved out of wood. This, this wooden item is then used and it's placed into sand. Um, so the sand forms around it. So that when that wooden item is removed, you're left with the impression in the sand of what would have been there before. We then heat metal up, usually in a, a furnace, as is being shown, or sometimes in a pot. Um, usually that's heated up to about 1600, 1700 degrees Celsius. That's then poured into, a, we, we call them shanks, um, and it is then poured into the mould. So once that mould is, is poured, um, then it's left to cool for about maybe 12 hours, something like that, depending on the size. And then um, the the mould is the box is taken away, and the casting is effectively there in the sand. From then, it's pulled out and um, just fettled and worked on. And in a nutshell, that's how to make a casting. So that's so, the, sorry. So the image we can see there is the item that's being taken out of the mould, which still has flames around it. And then yes. I think we have one more picture which shows the item being removed from the mould. And I think we did see this earlier when you were talking yeah. about the gutters, but that basically is how it would look when it so came those, out. So those images were just a sequence of that gutter being made effectively. Um, there's a few black art tricks of the trade in there, but um, generally everything that's made in cast iron is made the same way. Now, these these kind of skills and these ideas, these have been unchanged for 200 years. Um, the, the, the brass tacks of how things are made in cast iron will, will never change. Um, so, so it's nice. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I think it was in Victorian times that the using those methods that you just described, those production methods, they were able to produce cast iron in large enough quantities to work on major building projects. But it was also used for complex decorative features as well. And I understand that your company was not only involved in gutters and roof tiles, but you also had a role to play in replacing some of the damaged decorative castings on the tower. So please, can you tell us a little bit maybe about your work on those castings? Yeah, of course. So, um, so the, the, the amazing thing about cast iron that kind of still rings true today, um, but especially when they were building this, was that architects and designers effectively had a field day because they found this material that was durable and that could make any any complex shape that they'd ever imagined. Um, so so they're really they're able to let their imaginations run free. Um, so we we remade I think there was twenty different shields that all had different um, regal and different emblems um, on them. Um, they were all different designs, um, and amazingly enough, as mentioned, we made these exactly the same way using the same skills that they would have been made in the original place. Um, in addition to this, I think you can see just behind the shield there, there are these extremely floral decorative scroll sections. They, they fed that like a garland behind the shields. Um, we, all, we also remade the majority of them. Um, they were extremely difficult to make, um, but uh, I think the, the final results kind of speak for themselves with those. That's really amazing, isn't it? It's beautiful. The painting and the gilding and everything else, which I understand wasn't something that you did. You made the, the shields, 
that you sent them uh, away once they were made and then they were decorated when they got there. It's just you mentioned there were quite a few different um, designs and I just wondered if you had a favourite among those shield designs. Uh, my, my accent might give me away, but I have to say that I, I, I did like the Thistle one. Um, however, congratulations on the, the football result last night. Um, so yeah, we really liked that one. But um, I think the one that the, 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 the workers never mentioned was there, there was there was like a composite shield that had uh, that had um, the, the Rose, the Thistle and the, the Shamrock on it. Now that, that's not something that, you know, you come across a lot and it's, not, it's something that I've never seen before. So, so that one really kind of stuck out in the memory. It's beautiful, isn't it? And the, I think this is a great photograph because this is work in progress, because it looks like at the bottom right of that shield, there's a bit of overspray. And I think what they're putting on is something called size, which is the kind of the undercoat before you put the gilding. It makes the metal sticky so the gold leaf will stick to it. So it's nice to see this um, work in progress uh, before, as well as seeing that beautiful finished result of the thistle shield. Now, in order to do the work, um, you had to produce some things that, like gutters, were very functional. Uh, but Augustus Pugin, who worked on the interiors of the Palace of Westminster, always believed that an object should not just be functional, it should also be beautiful. And I believe that that principle applied when you were making um, gratings, landings and treads for the inside of the tower. It did, yes. So um, I think the, the the most obvious comparison today would be if you, if you can imagine an, an ornate spiral staircase that you see outside a lot of all homes. Um, the the internal stairways and landings in in the in the in, in the inside of the clock itself are almost just as ornate and as fantastic as the outside. Um, there are obviously some quite boring square mesh gratings, but a lot of the designs are like the one shown in the image being made there. Um, extremely ornate kind of diamond mesh with a quatrefoil outside. Um, this was very, very kind of a la mode at the time that this was made. So in, in my opinion, the, the, the internal ironwork of the tower is just as beautiful as the outside. And it would only ever be a handful, you know, a selection of people that would see it. So, you know, I, I find it quite amazing that they go to all this effort for something that, you know, a few people might see in the next hundred years. It's interesting, isn't it? Because all most people would want to do is just make sure they could walk safely along it rather than look down and admire the, the design. But lovely that it has both beauty and functionality. Now, in order to for all of the things that you made to be put in place, you work closely with another company called Shepley Engineers Limited, who are based in Sheffield. Uh, how was it working alongside another company? Because you actually weren't on the site to see all the things that you had made being fitted. So how did that work? I think we've got some images there of the Shepley engineers at work. Yes, so I mean, the UK has got some great manufacturing companies and we, we've got loads and loads of really, really impressive steelwork manufacturers. but. The, the cast iron isn't like steel. Um, steel you can bend, you can weld, you can hit it back into place and you can cut it easily. But with cast iron you don't have any of that kind of play. Um, so there, there aren't really, to be perfectly honest, as many contractors that we're comfortable working with. Um, Shepley's would be the exception to that. Um, they're, they're fantastic. Every restoration project when it comes to cast iron, Shepley are kind of like a, a, a go-to company. Um, so it's, it's been great work with them for the last few years. They are quite demanding sometimes. Um, however, that that's uh, I think that's a hallmark of being a good contractor, to be honest. Very true. And uh, maybe some of our audience joined us last week for a presentation about the work that Shepley's did on the tower, which was very extensive. Kevin, this has been absolutely fascinating. The insight into the production methods, the uh, the history of your company, the contribution you've made to the restoration of the tower. Uh, and I understand that of those foundries in the UK that are still operational, a lot of the work that they do is focused on the high tech um, cutting edge methods demanded by today's engineers. But in working on the tower, you had to use materials and highly skilled methods that dated back to your Victorian predecessors. So that what I've been wondering is, where do you find people with these skills? And more importantly, if there were young people who wanted to get involved in this kind of work, is there somewhere that they could learn those skills? So I have to admit, it is getting trickier and trickier to find people who want to work in a foundry these days. Um, the, the three guys there casting metal, they're all just 18 years old. Um, 
and actually two of them, their dads had worked in foundries previously. But where we are, because there used to be so many foundries here, there'll, there'll always be someone whose dad or whose uncle or whose granddad or great granddad worked in a foundry. So there's still that kind of familiar tie to, to working in foundries in our area. Um, so far as moving forward goes, it, it is getting very hard to find people um, to work in foundries. Um, it's one of those things where people come in and if they enjoy their first day, they'll probably be here for life. Um, if not, they'll probably never come back at all because um, it, it is a very heavy, very hot shift. Um, however, in, uh, in England right now, there's a, a fantastic foundry training centre that opened up two years ago. And um, it's really probably the probably the best training center in the entire world. It doesn't cover all of the the really old fashioned traditional methods that us and maybe a couple of other foundries use, but it does give a fantastic overall picture of foundry work. And, uh, and that's in uh, just outside of Birmingham. And it's a fantastic photo, the one we can see on the screen, isn't it? The the kind of atmospheric setting and uh, those, I guess you have to stand like that because probably that metal is so heavy that they're holding, is that right? So, yeah, so if you take the refactor and the metal into those parts, they're about 30 kilos each, um, which is why the guys rest them on their knee. It's, uh, it's an old fashioned foundry technique and, and that hasn't changed at all. Um, Again, it's something that I have tried and it's something I'm very, very bad at because if you pour the metal in too hard or too slow, the, the casting will be scrapped. So the guys will only ever pour their own moulds um, because they're too scared if someone else pours it, it might become scrap. OK, now that's very interesting. And I understand that um, some of the decorative work that we looked at earlier on, the scroll work, and we can see here uh, an image of scroll work that was removed, the old scroll work from the tower, and we can see it's quite sort of tarnished, dusty. Um, but we can also see how intricate and curving those pieces of iron are. And I understand that you used this as a test piece for your apprentices. Is that correct? It, it is, it is. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, it was a bit mean. Um, so generally a foundry apprenticeship to be a moulder back, back in the day um, used to be worth its weight in gold. Um, it was it was a fantastic career, it was very highly paid and it was a skilled profession. Um, and the apprenticeship used to be seven to nine years. Um, we don't have that luxury of time these days. So we gave this as a test to our apprentices. Um, and hands up, I, I would never be able to make that item in my life. Uh, it would be, it'd be a monstrosity if I attempted. And uh, two of them two of them managed to do it, um, which we think was a fantastic effort because um, y you're not going to get much more of a complex casting than that to make. And we can see the contrast there between the ones that they took off and the ones that are on the tower now. They're absolutely beautiful, aren't they? That curving, twisting, beautifully gilded. Uh, scroll work. So that's a fantastic image to end our conversation on. Thank you very much indeed again, Gavin, for all of that. And now it's time to turn to questions from our audience. And the first question is from Louise. And Louise asks, apart from the Elizabeth Tower, what is your favourite building that you've worked on and why? Ah, uh, that's a tricky one. Um, it would probably be the the Bayan Palace in Jeddah. Um, we we did um, just normal cast iron railings and gates, but they all had uh, an, an Arabic kind of an, an Arabic niche to them. Um, so we actually stole some of them to put around our foundry itself. So if if you ever come to Bones, you see these lovely Arabic railings around our small section of central Scotland. So I think that was probably one of the one of the favourite ones we've worked in, just because it was so different to anything that we've ever done before. Indeed, I think many of the images you showed us at the beginning were in Scotland, so the one you've just mentioned was a little more far flung. Uh, I realised that I didn't go to the first question. Uh, I went to the one at the bottom. So let's go back into the top and ask a question from Richard Blake. And he says, why the choice of cast iron? Aside from the weight, doesn't it rust? Yeah, it does. Um, so uh, uh, the, the difference, and uh, it's a bit of a, a common misconception really, um, when steel is left outside, it, it corrodes. So when iron rusts, it, it's not actually corroding. That, that rust is an oxide layer that the iron effectively makes to protect itself. So if you had just an iron bar and you left it outside, it would be naturally durable for about 200 years. After 200 years, it would then start to corrode badly. Um, so iron is extremely, extremely durable. It can be formed to make any shapes, as we saw with the, the tower, you know, there's a lot of different shapes. 
and kind of modern day, um, iron's seeing a bit of a renaissance for these exact reasons. Um, also, um, another thing that's very fashionable at the moment is obviously green credentials. Um, now, I can't sit here and say that we, we're not a high energy user, but what we do is we we buy old scrap iron, maybe stuff that's you know been there for 300 years. We melt that down and we turn that into a new product. And then in 300 years time or 200 years time, someone might buy those products, melt them down and turn them into something new. So I think because of the durability, the, uh, the, the fact that we can form co complex shapes and the fact that iron is readily available and cyclical, I think it's a, a great choice of material. I apologize for my pronunciation, but I think when we saw the Heeland Coos, they actually showed an early stage in the process that you were describing, didn't they? That beautiful orange finish. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, the most the most common thing to think about is uh, whenever you walk over a manhole cover, they've got that glorious kind of dull patina glow to them. Um, and most of those manhole covers will be about 100 years old um, and they're, you know, they're going to last another 100 years. So, so rust, uh, rust is, um, it, it's not going to be nice if it's on your gates and railings, but it doesn't actually damage the product itself. Thank you very much. A question from an anonymous member of the audience. If all the castings are made in Scotland, how are they transported to London or do you have a factory nearer to the site? I, I, well, I, th I think when, from, from my very limited knowledge, I think when they, they, they originally built it, I think there was 15 foundries near the site or just only making the roof castings. Um, I, we don't have that, um, that ability, I'm afraid. So we transported the goods from here um, down to Shepley's, um, which is um, just outside of Sheffield. And then they had to do the, the the kind of fitting and finishing works on the casting. They were then all done as like big lots, sent down to London for storage and then up on the site. So we tried to reduce the amount of transport by kind of filling full lorries with roof tiles. I think you've given us a, a clue to the answer to the next question because it said, where does the iron that you used on the project come from? So, yeah, it's a mix. Um, so th there's different grades of iron. Um, so generally th this was all in grade 250, which is our kind of mainly used for architectural and engineering applications. Um, so we, we just buy old scrap iron. Um, we buy trace elements of steel. Um, we effectively mix them all together. And then what comes out is that grade 250 iron. Um, so it's, it's a mix of steel, um, old cast iron and some pig iron, which we have to import from either Russia or Brazil. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive answer. Now, Alison Bentley has a completely different question. She says, if you are recreating ironworks that are ornate but unseen, was the original made by workers who had cathedral experience? Because doing ornate work in unseen places can be normal when the work is done for God's eyes only. Um, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert on that one, I'm afraid, um, so I'm not too sure. It's a fantastic question, and one that I, I'd really struggle to answer. Um, the, the only thing that um, in cathedrals there are, there were foundries that specialised in making the ventilation grills for churches and cathedrals, which is why they're so ornate. Um, but that, that's as much as I do on that one, I'm afraid. OK, well, try this one from Frank. This sounds slightly more technical to me. Do you use a shrinkage rule for making patterns? Do they vary for different material, different materials casting? Yeah, no, fantastic question. So everything that was um, on Parliament, if it was less than a metre, we worked to about a 1.1% shrinkage because we used that grade 250. Um, for the, the larger gutters, we went to about 1.8% just because there was more metal, so it contracted it a little bit more. Um, generally, with cast iron, you, you're going to be working to 1%. Um, if you're moving to, moving into aluminium, aluminium, sorry, um, that gets to about 1.5%. But um, as, as a general rule, 1% shrinkage is pretty much exact. Thank you very much. Um, another uh, it's not just a question, it's a comment and a question. So let's just go through it. It's from Gennaro. He says, thanks for the amazing talk. I would like to ask a couple of questions. First, how long does it take to work on each of the gutters? And second, I visited the palace and felt really immersed in the history of the British democracy and of the building itself. I think it's a great responsibility to work on this building. And how did you approach the responsibility and how did it feel to be, even though you weren't there, to be working on materials that were going to end up on this famous building? OK, so um, if, if we think about the gutters, uh, take, if we take the, the rounded gutter first, 
Um, I'd say that that was a long time in the making. Um, I think there would have been about six weeks of the, the woodworking pattern making to get that right, mainly due to the, the curved shape and the size. Um, making the castings right, I think we made them at a rate uh, of two per day, um, but then there was a lot of fettling work at the back end. So we'd probably be making completed items about four per week. Um, in general, working on something like um, Big Ben, um, yeah, it's, it's something that everyone's extremely proud of. Um, the, the second it's ready, we'll, we'll take the workers down and, and go down there. I think it's one of those things that there is a bit surreal because we, we make castings all the time and we, we never really get to see them in situ because we'll send them off throughout the UK or further abroad and not think too much about them. Um, but Big Ben being Big Ben, it's it's on TV all the time. You know, every time you watch the news, it's there. So the guys are constantly reminded that, you know, I made that or, or you know, we made that. So. Um, yeah, there's a, a huge amount of responsibility to get it right, but also there's a huge amount of pride from knowing that you've played a small part in, you know, what is one of the most famous buildings in the world. So it's something that we as a company and, and me, we're, we're extremely proud of. I would love to be, wa be walking behind your works outing to London when they cross <laughs> Westminster Bridge, knowing that you won an award for that and look up at the Elizabeth Tower and know your contribution there. It would be a great feeling. Yeah, um, you... Oh, so, sorry. No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. OK, no, no. Anyway, uh, let's move on now in uh, in Prime Minister's question. People often have supplementary questions and I think Frank has a supplementary question. He says, do the foundry casters allow for thermal expansion when items are in situ? Uh, yes, they do. Um, so that's so on the, on the roof, that wasn't too big, uh, too big an issue. But if you can imagine Westminster Bridge, that move about, moved about 18 mil per span, um, giving on the, the thermal expansion. And also that comes into effect. If you can imagine, there's lovely railings around Parliament Green at, at, the, at the palace. And those railings are going to come in and contract about 3%, um, given the, the variation in heat in the UK. Um, so it's something that when you're designing the castings, you have to take into account. Um, so yeah, very, very, very impressed with the audience questions. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. not, not making my evening very easy at all. Um, no, I, I think uh, Frank obviously has a little bit of uh, technical knowledge, I think, about these things. But here's another interesting question, which it talks about how you approach the heritage work. It says, do you have to do research to find out the old methods? I guess how things were made originally and where would you get that information? Um, so, so not really, um, just because it is a, it's a trade almost at time forgot. Um, you know, you, every if you imagine a race car, there's a million castings in there that are 3D printed and, you know, that are incredibly complex and, and modern. But with architectural castings, um, it's something that really has remained unchanged because if it's not broke, don't fix it. And it's not, you know, it's not mass industry. So it's a really a skill that's been handed down through the generations. Um, however, both Historic Scotland and Historic England keep fantastic records. I mean, absolutely brilliant records of a lot of the old jobs and these are all available. So there are um, there have been occasions where we're not sure how something was made. We know how we'd make it, but we're not sure how it would be made originally. And generally, generally looking back through either the historic records or indeed the catalogues that all foundries used to produce, we we're able to get quite a clear picture of how it would have been made and then we endeavour to try and make sure that we do it the same way. We're coming to the end of our time. I think we might be able to squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, Darren asks, what has happened to all of the iron work that had to be removed and replaced? So just outside my window behind, behind me right now is the Fourth River and they think there's about 2,000 tonnes worth of scrap iron work rusting away on the bottom there. Um, they realised after they'd removed everything during the war that um, it couldn't really be used for anything we needed at all in the war effort. Um, so it's really sad that you know all this glorious ironwork has been removed. Um, a lot of it was just chopped out and the rest of it was bought by foundries. So at least some of it was remade. Um, and a lot of it sadly again was exported because um, no other countries did that with all their ironwork and um, they needed scrap. So we, we sold it to the highest bidder, which is which is a real shame, really. Although I'm not complaining because I get to remake quite a lot of it. So it's quite good for us. Yeah, because you mentioned that it's a green industry and I, I wonder what happened to the bits and pieces on the Elizabeth Tower that they couldn't use. Were they also, um, would they, could they be melted down and used again? So they the could, yes. Um, and the, the Elizabeth Tower, though, because of its age, the, the castings are really full of phosphorus. 
Now they did this because the the, the castings are very thin and the phosphorus allowed it to run over the entire roof tile without there being any holes. Um, so we would have been able to use them, um, but I believe that these have all been kept um, in storage for historic records. Like I said, because there were no drawings of the specific tiles, they've kept their, they've kept these originals that have been pulled off the roof so that in maybe 100, 200 years, we'll be able to take them out and be able to copy them exactly. Fantastic. Well, Gavin, I, I'm sorry to say that I think we're out of time now for any more audience questions, but I just wanted to begin by thanking you for a fascinating insight into what you call, uh, describe as an ancient craft, but which is being used on this high profile project. And it's been really very, very interesting. And I'd also like to thank everyone who's been able to come along and join us for the event. I'm sure like me, you've learned a lot about casting. And if like me, you wanted to know more, you can always go on YouTube. There are lots of videos that explain how all these magical arts that Gavin was describing, uh, you can actually not do yourself, but at least you have a better understanding of how it's done. Anyway, uh, let's come back to Westminster just to say a couple of things about what's going on in the UK Parliament. Next Wednesday, we have a talk on the construction and conservation of the tower. So if this has whetted your appetite, do join us for that. We go into much more detail about the history of the tower and you'll have see some wonderful pictures of the restoration work. There's also coming up, I think, on the 15th of July, an amazing talk about the extraordinary coronation banquet of George IV. So if that whets your appetite, come along and join us for that. And also you will find on the UK Parliament website that we're now advertising our audio tours, our multimedia tours again. So if you fancy a visit to Parliament and you'd like to use one of those guides to help you around, you can actually buy tickets for that now. I think it opens at the end of July. Um, just one final reminder that that survey that was on the chat box, if you have a moment to complete that, we would really appreciate it. Don't forget, you can get 15% off some of the many wonderful things that can be found in the Parliament gift shop. I sound a bit like a salesman. I didn't mean to. I apologise. But uh, just to say by bringing all this to a conclusion that um, it's it's ver a very been a very special evening. And I would also like to thank the amazing team behind the scenes, uh, Thalia and Lindsay and Richard and Isabel, who've supported us this evening to make sure everything worked. So thank you very much to all of the team for making sure that happened. And I would like to wish you all a very good evening. And I hope to see you again, either in person or virtually back here at the Palace of Westminster. Thank you very much and good night. Mm -hmm.